Good morning and welcome. We gather today nearing the end of our Lenten journey. We remember in prayer those journeying to the sacraments at the Easter Vigil, including Anthony Ranieri, who participated in his last rite of scrutiny at church yesterday afternoon. Once again, instead of our regular Lenten cycle, we will be reading from the Gospel of John with the elect. These special readings have been used since the early church to prepare for baptism. So today we will listen with new ears. But first, let us begin our prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. As we enter into today's prayer, we open our ears and our hearts to listen and encounter God's mercy. As we begin, let us mute our mics and sing together the Kyrie. If you feel comfortable doing the gestures, please join along. Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Christ eleison, Christ A reading. Let us pray. As once in the vision, O God, your prophet summoned the spirit so that dry bones stood up alive, and as once your son stood fearless at death's door, calling Lazarus to come forth alive, raise us up with Christ from the death of sin that all of us the elect and the baptized may be unbound and set free. We ask this through Christ, whose gifts are water, light, and life. The Lord who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever, amen. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ,
Christ from the dead. We'll give life to your mortal bodies also through God's spirit that dwells in you. The word of God. from the letter of Paul to the Romans. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you through the body Though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through God's spirit that dwells in you. The word of God. Praise to you, word of God, Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, word of God, Lord Jesus Christ. Shh. 
The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. There was a certain man named Lazarus who was ill. He and his sisters, Mary and Martha, were from the village of Bethany. Mary was the one who anointed the feet of Jesus with perfume and dried his feet with her hair. And it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So the sisters sent this message to Jesus. Rabbi, the one you love is ill. When Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness will not end in death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Finally, Jesus said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, it was only recently that the people there tried to stone you, and you want to go back there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, Jesus told the disciples, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples objected, but Rabbi, if he is only asleep, he will be all right. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to the rest, let us also go so that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Since Bethany was only about two miles from Jerusalem, many people had come to console Martha and Mary about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Your brother will rise again, Jesus assured her. Martha replied, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Those who believe in me, even if they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Martha replied. I have come to believe that you are the Messiah, the son of God the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here asking for you. As soon as Mary heard this, she got up and went to him. Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met her, him. Those who were there consoling her saw her get up quickly and followed Mary, thinking that she was going to the tomb to mourn. When Mary got to Jesus, she fell at his, sleep and, at his feet and said, if you had been here, Lazarus never would have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the other mourners as well, he was troubled in spirit and deeply moved. Jesus said, where have you laid him? Come here and see, they said, and Jesus wept. The people in the crowd began to remark, see how much he loved him? Others said he made the blind person see. Why could he have not done something to prevent Lazarus' death? Jesus was again deeply moved. They approached the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha said, Rabbi, 
already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Jesus raised his eyes to heaven and said, Abba, thank you for having heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd that they might believe that you sent me. Then Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came out of the tomb, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go free. Many of those who had come to console Martha and Mary saw what Jesus did. The good news of salvation. Thanks to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. During one of my courses in the living school a few years back, James Finley reflected with us that if we look at the healing stories in the gospel, each one is different. The one thing happens over and over and over again. Jesus approaches the person who is suffering. My daughter died. I have leprosy. I can't see. I can't walk. I can't whatever. And Jesus sees the dilemma of their suffering. And then he sees through their suffering into the invincible preciousness of the person in Christ before the origins of the universe. And Jesus sees that your real suffering is not what you're suffering. Your suffering is that you think you are what's wrong with you. You think that your painful circumstance has the authority to name who you are. And Jesus, acknowledging that pain, sees through the pain. And seeing directly into your preciousness, and you look back and see yourself reflected in the eyes of Jesus. And some of that pain that was on your shoulders then begins to shift onto Jesus's shoulders. And Jesus invites us beyond our pain and reminds us that this pain does not have the power or the authority to name who we are. On this last Sunday before Palm Sunday, we dare to take a look at the last enemy, death. And the only way we can dare to part the curtain and view death is to be told about our own resurrection from it. And so what is the point then of this last dramatic story, this last dramatic sign just before Jesus' Jesus's own journey toward death? One thing we see in this tomb in which Lazarus is buried is a scene of great intimacy. When Martha sends for Jesus, she simply says, Master, the one you love is sick. That's it. She doesn't tell him to come. She doesn't tell him how bad it is. This is the Jesus who was fond in a very special way because Jesus loved Martha and Mary and loved Lazarus and used to stay with them in their home in Bethany just a stone's throw away from the temple in Jerusalem when Jesus went there to pray. And so it is that the first word in John's description of what is to take place is Jesus loved her. And this is a key to understanding our gospel today. It's about love. Jesus loves Martha. Jesus loves Mary and Lazarus. Jesus loves his disciples. And Jesus loves people. That's what Jesus does. He has come to bring the love of God into the ordinariness of their everyday lives. 
And so what plays out in this tomb where Lazarus was laid is a scene of great intimacy where we see these deep bonds. And we also see here Jesus's humanity. He wept, he was troubled in spirit. He was deeply moved. And Jesus shows very real human emotions, experiencing grief and sadness and loss, as we do. The second thing we see in this tomb is that Jesus begins to show us the pattern that these bonds of love do not end in death. And we'll come back to this tomb, this scene of great intimacy in just a moment. But first, let us take a step back and take a glimpse into a culture very different from our own. A few years back, four of us couples from the family mass traveled down to Albuquerque, New Mexico for an extended weekend retreat on the universal Christ. And one of the speakers was John Dominic Crossan. And in Crossan's presentation, he shared with us images of the resurrection that he began to notice in the Eastern churches, places like Cappadocia and Istanbul. Now remember that the event of the resurrection is not described anywhere in the New Testament. Artists had to figure out how to portray the resurrection without any text to guide them. Crossan noted that in the West, we have Jesus coming out of the tomb alone. Jesus, our Western notions portray, rised as alone without anyone by his side. But in the East, you have Jesus holding the hand of Adam and Eve and leading them out of Hades. Crossan said it could be seen everywhere he went in Turkey, and he became curious. He started visiting churches in Egypt and Russia and Romania and realized that this is the normal resurrection image for all of Eastern Christianity. Fascinating. So these very different portrayals reflect to us that the Eastern churches have a universal vision of Jesus arising with all of humanity, symbolized by Adam and Eve and others. Western Christianity has a more individualistic vision of Jesus, arising glorious and triumphant, but also solitary and alone. In the Eastern vision, all of humanity is inside the story. I'm inside the story. You're inside the story. It's not outside of us. It's not like somebody is doing it for us. Crossan asserts that the image of the universal resurrection is the more theologically accurate portrayal of Christ's resurrection. And he reminds us about what Orthodox believers have embraced for centuries. Christ's resurrection was a universal communal event. Christ's resurrection was a universal communal event. Christ's resurrection was not for the sake of stunning us with his divine glory. It was so we, the new Adam and Eve created in God's image can rise with Christ and live fully in the light of divine goodness. And so now back to our gospel story of Lazarus. If Christ's resurrection is a universal communal event, Jesus begins to show us this pattern in the raising of Lazarus. In a final brilliant finale, Jesus invites his onlookers to join him in making resurrection happen. Move the stone away, unbind him, and let him go free. It seems that we too 
have a part to play in creating a culture of life and resurrection. We must unbind one another from our fears and our doubts about the last enemy, death. We must now see that the world is bathed in light and allow others to see the same thing through our lived life. The stone to be moved away is always our fear of death, the finality of death, and anything that prevents us from seeing that death is merely a part of the larger mystery we call life. Death does not have the final word. This sleep is not to end in death, but is instead for the glory of God. And with a sigh that came straight from the heart, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, move the stone away. Lazarus, come forth. Now, you unbind him and let him go free. And I will 